Thank you. So uh, this talk is called Innovation for a Nation, a model from the UK for funding in a down economy. So this fits very well with uh, the previous speaker's uh, depiction of the environment that we're all trying to subsist within. Well, so I don't think it's quite subsistence just yet. But, um, we have David Flanders here. David came down for last year's e-research. Um, and then he came back again in January for good. So that's a, that's a good sign about how well we're doing down in this neck of the woods in terms of e-research. Um, David's going to introduce his previous boss, Rachel Bruce from JISC, who's going to talk to us via video, because she couldn't make it down today. But we've got a good video of Rachel here. I'll hand over to David uh, to make the introduction. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, so it's a 24-minute video, so we'll, we'll get started right away. I'll just say that Rachel Bruce is the director of digital infrastructure for the JISC. So um, she's going to draw some interesting comparisons. And actually, it's a, it's a really good talk. Um, and of course, I'll pass the video on to people, because she made it especially for this. So you're not getting cheated by a generic presentation. It is specifically uh, for this. So without further ado, <laughs> your feature presentation. Hello, I'm Rachel Bruce, Innovation Director from JISC in the UK. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with you today, even though it's only virtually, um, at your conference, eResearch Australasia. Thank you very much for asking me to speak to you about the UK's research infrastructure and what JISC is doing in this area in terms of supporting research and the sorts of techniques that we're using. This presentation will outline JISC's activity in the area of digital infrastructure for education and research, and I'll highlight some of the directions we're taking um, in some of this, and, and I guess in this backdrop of um, the economic climate that we've been experiencing. But my main point is really that there's an opportunity and perhaps a necessity for collaboration between countries like the UK and Australia. As most of you all know, JISC provides digital infrastructure for all UK universities in the areas of research, learning, and administration. Um, but I hope this presentation gives you perhaps another lens on what JISC does um, in terms of your current experience of it and the sorts of things that we do with all of the universities within the UK. JISC's joined up approach to infrastructure is, of course, about being more effective and efficient. It always has been. Um, we're now celebrating around 20 years of a joined up approach through JISC. Um, we were established back in the early 90s, but it was way back in 1984, I think, that the computer board was established and the academic network began. And since then, JISC has grown with data centers, shared content procurement, and a substantial program of ICT-related innovation activities. So it's now quite a large organization. Lately, we've been reflecting on you know, the main ethos, really, behind JISC. Um, we've developed these three principles and really honed it down to these three about collaboration and continually um, the need for experimentation, um, but importantly, that quality of service. I think I should give you a little bit more background as to why at the moment we're especially looking at ways to optimize the infrastructure that we provide and to try and undertake some consolidation. So we've had some challenges to address. Um, I mentioned the economic backdrop. Well, back in 2008, our economy started to slump. Then in 2010, the new government came in and there was an examination of public expenditure. Inevitably, this put some of the quango type activities into question and JISC in the way in which we operate falls into that because we're a public body. So in 2011, Professor Sir Tim Wilson reviewed JISC and in short, I'm happy to say um, that the conclusion was that JISC is a good thing and it must persist. But in order for us to do this, we need to look at some deduplication, some consolidation where that's possible. Um, JISC is, is quite complex in terms of its governance currently and its setup. So there's something like 73 services, three companies, and five related bodies, and a large innovation program of projects, some 200 projects a year. Um, I should explain what a related body is. It's just basically an organization that's hosted somewhere else and we have um, a funding agreement with them to deliver um, some of our services or projects. 
So this is some undertaking um, to respond to this review, but we're well on our way. Um, and on the 1st of December, our new company will be created. And this creation of a new company will actually help to address some of the consolidation and some of the governance issues that were raised in the review, because we'll be able to work better, more effectively, and under one shared strategy and vision, um, more closely governed and linked together. There's still a lot to do, but as you can see here, we're also looking at slightly different governance. Um, and um, Universities UK, the University VC body, is becoming one of JISC owners, as are the heads of colleges. Alongside this, we're also looking at how we can ensure our operations are tighter and more effective. So in terms of horizon scanning and experimentation, that's still absolutely essential, but we need to get a, a, a more effective pipeline, if you like, um, to capture the, the outputs from that into um, shared service infrastructure and that sort of um, shared infrastructure that you see within the JISC portfolio. So we know we need to be more effective at that. Um, underpinning all of this is real co-design where we're working with our users and with universities all the time. So partnership is really important and international collaboration maintain, um, sorry, is still very important um, and is required for us to achieve our goals. So thinking about international collaboration um, and the UK and Australia, um, I think we do share a few characteristics. One, of course, is our language um, and the shared ethos that we have towards research and infrastructure. I think our policy and practice around this is quite similar. Um, of course, there are some differences. If we look at the comparisons between the UK and Australia, um, let's compare some of our funding landscape. So you'll see in this slide here um, the UK funding figures in our sector. Um, and of course, some of the comparisons between UK and Australia is really about reflecting our different geographies. So the UK landmass could fit into Australia 58 times, but the UK has 168 universities and Australia only 47. Australia has 1.2 million students enrolled and the UK 2.5 million. Therefore, the average number of students at an Australian university is far higher than that at a UK university. So in some senses, this will give us some slightly different challenges in terms of scale of infrastructure and those sorts of things. But let's look at the world of university rankings and research profile. In the UK and Australia, you can see here, we do reasonably well in terms of the number of universities in the top 100 considering our size. So these are the THES um, rankings, um, which are fairly well respected metrics. The UK has 12 universities in the top 100 and Australia seven. In the UK, we're really proud of our research performance and um, the, the fact that we're a world leader in terms of article citation, um, and that's both per researcher and per unit of research spending. However, we're very much aware that the global landscape is very fluid, and we need to try and maintain this position. I looked back at an analysis um, of research performance from the University's 94 group in the UK. And they, interestingly, in the report, really come to highlight some of the similarities between the UK and Australia, which I think it's quite important to think of as a backdrop here. So both countries come up in the metrics that they used as very highly productive with our research producing more research competencies per number of researchers than the other countries that they compared against. And they were obviously looking at high-performing research countries. The report also draws out the fact that we both have dual support systems for our research. And it was really quite stark in terms of the difference when you looked at the lower proportion of business funded research that there was in UK and Australia as compared to the other countries, but the higher proportion of research that was publicly funded at universities. So we had the most productive research, but that was our common funding profile. Of course, the report does say you may not be able to draw huge conclusions from that, but they're interesting um, comparisons nevertheless. Um, and it does seem to show some form of trajectory that though that funding profile produces that productivity. 
So here, just to quickly show you, the pie chart here from The Guardian shows how well the UK and Australia are doing comparatively in terms of our top performing universities. But see the quote, Chinese universities and others are catching up. And of course, we need to be aware that they may well take over. So one thing um, I think we can do is to ensure we are competing digitally with the rest of the world and that we have a world-class digital infrastructure. I know in the UK we have always prided ourselves on attracting the best researchers and I know that infrastructure is very important in terms of attracting researchers. Um, for instance, recently um, the UK government cut some of its funding support for the European PRACE HPC initiative. We were still part of that, but it meant that our researchers were slightly lower down the queue for high performance compute. And I know that researchers considered moving away from the UK because of that. So the question, how can we remain competitive? I guess I'm saying that through some form of consolidation and collaboration around digital infrastructure, we can try and remain competitive. And I think the UK can learn from Australia and of course vice versa. So what does it mean? What is it that I'm saying we should collaborate on? Well, here's an outline of the infrastructure stack, right from the network to the data to the skills. On what parts should we collaborate? I'm not quite sure. We need to learn how to prioritize. But there are some obvious ones which I'll cover and we can perhaps reflect on whether or not they make sense to you. So of course, digital infrastructure is more than bytes and boxes. It's also socio-technical. And this report highlighted here from the US Cyber Infrastructure Workshop says the same. The findings point to the need for technical and people networks and collaboration in both technical and human ways. I suppose if we think of um, the internet such as the academic networks um, and the information as a, an information superhighway, we know we need bridges and we know we need ways to navigate this and it needs to be cross-border and cross-domain. So just coming to some of the obvious um, areas in which we might collaborate and in terms of where we already probably are collaborating. If we look at networking, currently in the UK we have SuperJanet, we've got 18 million users, six core points of presence in the UK, and it's a highly resilient and high bandwidth network. By October 2013, we are luckily um, going to be upgrading to SuperJanet 6. Um, the government's invested 36 million pounds there to ensure that we can maintain a super fast network and compete internationally. It's very much um, about the, the international um, competition, that investment from the UK government. We need to ensure that data can be transferred and collaboration with research infrastructure can take place effectively across the globe. After all, research is global. Another fairly obvious one is in access management. So in the UK, we've got the UK Access Management Federation based on SAML. I think you've got a fairly similar um, organization in, the Austra in Australia. Um, in the UK, we've got 900 members, um, of course, like you, it supports single sign-on um, and it supports access to multiple resources. But we do need to develop this infrastructure. There's a continual need to develop it, to make sure that there's inter-federation working so we can support virtual organizations, multiple collaborations across boundaries and borders, both within our countries and outside. Um, another important initiative here actually is a Janet-led initiative, Moonshoot, um, in partnership with Giant in Europe, um, where they developing a single unifying technology, which allows the benefits of that access management across non-web services, so things like cloud infrastructure, HPC, and grid. So again, that's quite an interesting area and development in um, access management that we might want to look at more exploitation between countries like UK and Australia. So changing tax slightly, um, when we think about um, how to make research competitive and the sorts of other frameworks that might underpin it. So things like IP. Um, if we go back to 2008, Senator Kim 
Kim Carr, who I think was your innovation minister at the time, he stated quite clearly evidence had started to show that the previous push for researchers to commercialize their output just didn't work. So you needed to start to look at different ways. Similarly, in the UK, we find that universities seldom make significant income from their IP. It's something around 6%, I think, of UK universities' income is from commercial exploitation of IP. So this starts to point to the fact we need new ways to support innovation and research. So I thought here I'd outline some of the recent developments we've seen in the UK that demonstrate a commitment to infrastructure in a broad sense. But they show ways in which information and knowledge infrastructure is being developed. So research contributes to the economy um, and where there are some changes in the way in which we work perhaps required. So I've already mentioned the investment in Superjanet 6. Well, alongside that, the government's also in invested in other e infrastructure. Um, we've also seen the launch of the Open Data Institute, which is a collaboration between leading businesses and entrepreneurs, universities and researchers. And it's all about unlocking the social value from open government data and making that accessible and understanding how it can be exploited to drive innovation. Then we've also got um, the Big Innovation Centre and work they've been doing around big data, so how big tools that support big data analysis um, can also help to exploit um, different information sources and drive innovation and new knowledge. Um, another thing I should mention is the research gateway um, that the, the government funded, the research councils um, gave them a grant of two million um, to make sure that all of um, the research that was funded by the research councils was actually accessible across the web. Now, that's very much targeted at access for SMEs, but of course, universities are a key stakeholder. And in actual fact, JISC um, is undertaking some additional work there to ensure that UK universities can exploit that information and can contribute to um, that information base. And then I should mention, I said about IP frameworks, well, we've seen the Hargreaves IP review, which has allowed a lot of exceptions for research and education, again, with the belief that that can really drive um, new, mod new knowledge and new innovation. A very big, um, I think, step forward in terms of research data and research data infrastructure uh, within the UK and the imperative for us to build it is the Royal Society's report um, that came out, I think it was June or July this year, Science as an Open Enterprise. So they really concluded that we really needed to move to the position of making research data, that data produced in research and large data sets that are used for research, openly available. But they used the term intelligently open. And so that was about making sure it can be used um, in ways in which it can be understood, recombined, and accessed easily. And, and so in order to do that, um, they state, and, and obviously, an infrastructure is required. And then I'll just finally, of course, I, I have to mention the fact that within the UK, our government has um, pushed gold open access publishing. Green still counts, um, but they are providing funds um, for gold open access. So that's some of the, the background in terms of, I think, different trajectories in the way in which we could perhaps collaborate around research and taking that broad interpretation of research infrastructure. So if I reflect on some of the prime areas from my perspective that I think we could seek collaboration on and that collaboration would help us within the UK undertake things more effectively and efficiently, um, I've mentioned research data. We are already collaborating in the area of research data. You've got the Australian National Data Service um, within the UK. We have a large amount of activity. Perhaps we haven't had the same investment if you, as you've had in Australia, um, but we have undertaken work with the Digital Curation Center, with our research data management program, and also we're now starting to build um, a discovery layer based on actually the Australian Research Data Discovery Service. But I know from exchanges I've, I've had with Ross Wilkinson and Andrew Trelaw and others in Australia, there's far more that can be done there in terms of collaboration. Um, 
Another one, I think, is the area of research technologists. Um, and this includes both um, the skills around data curation, but the skills also of researchers to use technology within their research, whether it's about building software so they can undertake analysis, um, or also being able to support colleagues in other ways um, in terms of, I suppose, the sharing of data and the reuse of that data. What we often find is there isn't recognition of those sorts of skills within the research system. And yes, that, yet they're absolutely essential for us to exploit knowledge and to produce innovative research um, nowadays. Recently, we had a group with um, some European colleagues, and we were all really saying the same, that we needed to ensure that um, there were the opportunities for people to, to learn those skills um, and that we needed to also make sure that those that had those skills were recognized so we had a fully digitally literate um, cohort of researchers and university support staff. And I think that is an international issue and something that, again, the UK and Australia could perhaps work on. Um, in terms of thinking about how to stay ahead. And then in the area of cloud, JISC has undertaken quite a lot of work within the cloud, and a lot of it has been about analysis and experimentation. So we've undertaken work with the research councils to see how it can be used to improve research. But we have also built um, a cloud brokerage service with Janet, which um, actually has got framework agreements in place to negotiate um, cloud storage and compute for UK universities. Um, and also, we're starting to make some applications for research available on that cloud infrastructure. I'm not sure. I think our progress is perhaps is not as advanced as yours in Australia. I know that through Nectar, you've built a really interesting model in terms of cloud provision. Um, and that's something that I think this area we could really learn from, because I know it's actually quite complex. Um, when we've done some analysis, cloud um, simply to replace um, your infrastructure within your institution is not always the most economically sensible answer, although there are other benefits in terms of flexibility. So it'd be interesting anyway to exchange in terms of how you can provide national infrastructure for universities. And finally, I would just say, um, personally, I really think um, there's a lot to do under what I would call semantic knowledge infrastructure. Um, and so by this, I mean things about key identifier sets. So they might be researcher identifiers, but they might be geospatial identifiers, organizational identifiers, the sorts of ways in which we can reuse information um, so we can exploit it more fully. But also um, techniques and tools around text mining um, and machinable readable rights. So I, th I think there's actually quite a, a, a rich area of what, as I say, that I would call semantic knowledge infrastructure that would be a prime space for collaboration. Okay, I haven't got much time now. Um, so if I just hear this slide actually shows a kind of loose infrastructure comparison, um, which again might give us some ideas of where we're already quite similar, um, but, but some key areas where we could collaborate. So you've got um, an, our networks, um, our access management federations, our research data management um, setups and infrastructure, um, also the cloud infrastructure that I've mentioned, and um, national data centers. Um, so I think it's just worth kind of seeing that and seeing how we do move forward in similar ways, and perhaps there are other things that we can exploit. So we need to ask, really, what else might there be? Um, and I think the amount of areas in this space is absolutely vast. So yes, as I said earlier, we need to prioritize. But I do think collaboration is key so we can actually um, do things more effectively and remain more competitive. One thing we do know is developing infrastructure takes time. And this diagram from the seminal cyber infrastructure report in the US shows just how long it's taken to develop some transport infrastructures, um, which is quite a useful comparison. So assuming in the area of digital infrastructure, we've just started building on the upward curve, what might be our next steps? Um, are there areas I've raised that might be of joint interest? What would be? the priorities for sharing experiences, and how might we share experiences effectively? How can we ensure we keep our digital infrastructure up to date and we keep a pace 
especially when there might be economic challenges. So there are more challenges than answers, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope David can take questions and capture people's ideas um, and have a discussion with you um, in terms of potential challenges we may both face and opportunities for collaboration. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, uh, David, thank you for arranging that with Rachel. No that was a very interesting talk. And it's Toughest presentation ever. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're really, really sweating it there. It just, so it's, it's great to see the international collaboration um, theme there. And, and I guess um, the only risk for Rachel was if she came down, she might never have returned. Uh, so any questions for, for David? He's happy to take questions on the presentation. Can you come up to the, the I can, mic? I can repeat if you want to yell yeah. the recording. Go on, I'll, I'll repeat it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, I just wondered whether in the matching up of the infrastructure, the UK has exhausted all its attempts to link into the European theatre, and whether the proposed links with Australia and New Zealand, or the not explicitly mentioned, are a sort of English language centric grouping, possibly against China, as was mentioned in there. Is, is this a last stand for the English language people? I, 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 I think one of the, I, I mean, it, it's just a basic interoperability question, isn't it? If you're both using the same programming language, uh, it, it, it does become a little bit easier to collaborate. Um, but that's not to say that they're not. So I know presentations are happening in Brazil of this, the same matter. The point is, and what you really need to take away from this is the collaboration between international partners means your money will go a lot further. Um, and they don't care who that is. Obviously, they've geared this for uh, an Australian audience, but they are definitely engaging other international collaborations, which I think is a lesson that actually uh, Aust Australasia could, could learn. I should say I speak as someone who in 1994 had to translate some hydrological modeling code from Italian into English so I could work on it and then translate it back. Yeah. But just the code. I don't speak Italian very well. Indeed. No, the, the real push of this is that you've got to realize that um, if Australia is heading into this, uh, th this is why they felt the presentation was interesting, right, is the question of if you're heading into the black, what are you, what are you going to expect to do? And those ideas that they, you don't understand, they, they're saying it very lightly, the idea of collaborating and, and consolidating. But to get them to put this presentation out with how much political effort is going on right now to consolidate and collaborate, you can't believe it. So in a year's time at this year's conference, this might be a little glimpse of what you're actually going to have to do to consolidate things. And I know we're already going through it, right, from an end's point of view. So um, the, these are lessons you really do need to pay attention to in that sense. Yeah, well, I, I, I can repeat. We're having the same uh, conversation in New Zealand, and I think it's about to heat up as well. Um, yeah, so. Alex Reid in Arnett. Um, Arnett is already collaborating very closely with Janet, of course. Yeah. And yeah. I go to the UK every year and spend time with them working out what things we can do in common. But um, I have a sort of more high level question, which relates to an, uh, an arrangement or an agreement, co um, contract even, which was set up between the UK, Australia, New Zealand and Holland yeah. called the E-Framework, which was designed to sort of you know, put all of this in a great, wonderful framework so we could all work together. What's happened to that? I, I've not heard of it for a year or two. So Ian Dolphin moved on to, Ian Dolphin, who was really pushing it, moved on to the Sakai Foundation. So you really lost the champion um, in, that, in those efforts. Um, that's not to, the, the point is, is, well, that implementation has probably lost funding and, and, and doesn't have any core funding from what I know. But of course, all the GIST budgets are being renewed right now as they become a company. They desperately want to still find new ways of collaborating. It might not be via the e-framework sort of programmatic thing. It might be a looser thing. And I think that's the stack you saw where it's talking about you, you don't just have to collaborate. You know, it's, it's down at the bottom level, working what we already do with RNET and AAF. Um, but then up at the upper level, you know, what about working across developer communities? You know, Paul Walk was down here last year talking about, look, we've got this developer community. you got a developer community. Why aren't we working together on this? We're all solving the same problem. You know, internationally, they already do this. Apache works internationally. They don't work nationally. Um, so we need, we need to think about those, those strata and layers and where. But in terms of finding opportunities, for just, I would really encourage you, they are looking for those international partners. So 
Um, and you guys are doing great with, with Arnett and Janet. I, I just had a, a chat uh, recently about um, the efforts. But I think we need to replicate that in other things, not just in authorization and network, but also looking um, at uh, things like data and cloud, as Rachel pointed out in that, in, that, in that slide. There's a lot of opportunities, so contact GIST and get them to know. You'd be amazed. You go, you go over to the UK for one of these longer trips, take an extra week and ask GIST to introduce you to some people. They have fingers in every single institution, and they are glad to um, find those collaborations. I've, I've, I've lined up some myself uh, in previous years with the California Digital Library and with um, several institutions. So they're very open in international collaboration to, I, I think, an extent is actually a world-leading uh, initiative. And I say this, obviously, with an American accent and then obviously having lived here and in the UK. So um, I like what they're doing internationally and not closing their borders towards international collaboration. There's probably a couple of people that could talk about the New Zealand side of the e-framework part of that relationship as well in the room. Um, I think probably at a very high level it was a consolidated, integrated view that was perhaps ahead of its time. Uh, perhaps the community wasn't there to be consolidated mm. at the time that it existed. And did we, if we had some high-level schema like that, as Rachel put up on the screen, we might have a way of thinking about it more coherently now. Yeah. That's probably another answer. Um, John. Hello, I'm uh, John Bancroft. I'm from the STFC in England. Um, part of the infrastructure investment that saw GIST get some funding and Janet also funded the Hartree Centre, which is where I work. Uh, it's a software development centre. Our machines are there to develop and demonstrate new software so that people can take advantage of e-infrastructure. I would just echo the call for collaborators, please, because we all get good points for having international collaborators. And the low-hanging fruit are people who speak English and who think and uh, have a culture that's pretty similar to, to, that, to that in the UK. So not just through Rachel and yourself and Jisk, but also through myself and the Hartree. Please work with us because if we don't make the e-infrastructure really pay, it's going to be awfully hard to go back and get some more money from the government. And I, I will point out one of the things I miss the most in the UK is our research council partners because the research councils actually had data centers. So you had a place to go and put your data with the reach. So the research council was saying, you will we'll fund you, but we, we want your data inside our um, data center. And so we were able to then bar into that infrastructure. And I don't know if you saw the little disclaimer on Rachel's slide, but that mapping, it's a significant hole without the seven, the, um, seven research councils and what they've achieved in terms of their infrastructure, which I still think is somewhat immature here in the UK with regards to research councils actually trying to push forward, or in Australia rather, and trying to push forward um, what's our contribution to actual infrastructure. It, it, I don't see that conversation happen. I've only been in the country a year though, so I will hold my hands up in ignorance. I don't think the UK is that coordinated. We've only just begun to collaborate with our own STFC colleagues who have an infrastructure for possible physics and astronomy. Yeah. And that, co that community has been running for a decade. Yeah. And we've only just begun to talk to them. And it, it's even more fun in the States watching them fight about it. <laughs> okay, unless there's any more comment, um, I'll just ask you to, to join me in thanking David and, and Rachel. Uh, <laughs> we're here, so you, you get the privilege.